It was born at Wordsley Hospital um, in Stourbridge, which is no longer there, uh, in June, 29th of June, 2003. Um, yeah, very memorable day. I remember my childhood being really fun, like I always got the chance to play, a lot of chance to be creative, had a lot of fun. Obviously, similar age to my brother, so me and him would get up to loads and my dad would Mum would always join in and stuff, take us places, so yeah, really fun. They didn't play a lot of football, Do didn't play a lot, I didn't seem to be interested in football at all. If you gave him a ball, he'd throw it, didn't really want to kick it, so no, not a lot at all. Do you find that ironic now, given... Absolutely, well absolutely. It just seemed that nothing happened until he was like six and then something clicked, but um, before that, if you give him a ball, he'd just want to throw it back at you, he'd pick it up, he wouldn't want to kick it, so... My earliest memories of playing football was a coaching thing that my dad did on a Sunday morning and I never really enjoyed it but I kind of just did it because like my dad wanted me to and I really enjoyed the racing at the start and like you know the cat and mouse games but the actual football I didn't really didn't really love like I do now and then one weekend it just clicked and all of a sudden that was all I wanted to do all the time so I watched quite a bit of my dad, but I didn't really watch much professional football or stuff on the telly, maybe a bit of match of the day, but the, the main football that I watched was my dad playing mostly for Leamington. Oh, Mark is a non-league legend. If you, I think he got 600 goals, um, and he's played, played at a really good level, um, non-league, so yeah, he's a striker, um, and he's still playing today. I remember it was kind of at first it was always I was like forced to go a little bit and then when obviously as I said I got that switch and I just started loving it I wanted to go with him all the time and not only then would we go we chat about it as well like I said dad you could do this better you could do that better or something like that and then as I started playing he'd say oh you could do this better you could do that better so it kind of worked both ways so that was really good. I think Mark would have had meltdown if he didn't want to play football but I think it was a big influence um, not forcing him to play football, but just being involved, being around it all the time. I think it was just a natural progression into it. Um, and then later on, you know, he was interested as well. So um, it, it just came naturally, it seems. It's, it's been good, but obviously now he's, he's made it to Blues. That's all we've, he, uh, both of us have ever wanted really, just to, to play football and especially for Blues as well. So growing up with Jude's been, been fun. Both of them, worked so hard to get me to the places that I need to get just to play football properly but even before I was like enjoying it they'd always say go out there work hard and enjoy it we're not going to force you to do anything you don't want to enjoy so try and enjoy it and if you don't then we'll stop but luckily I ended up like loving it and yeah the rest is history I guess yeah. Mark was playing in a cup final on a Sunday morning. I'd gone along to watch and uh, I think Job, I don't think Job was walking, I think Job was in a push chair with, with Denise and Jude was running all over the place. Uh, just under the barriers, onto the pitch. He wanted to take part in the warm up. Uh, he wanted to go on his dad's shoulders. He wanted to be in the team talk at half time. He, he, was, uh, he was all over the place. Yeah, that was my first, uh, first memory of Jude. Yeah, so that was a team that my dad coached again called Stalbridge Junior. So I think at the time he was playing for the senior team and he basically set up that team for me and my mates because we that was something that we wanted to do. Um, something like a bit extra stuff. So it was actually a team set up for like that one year because I ended up going to Blues the next year and it kind of folded after that. So uh, that's how it, I remember it, us playing properly at the start. Take it off the night, you really mean it now. Go on, Tom. Go on, Jude. Go on, lovely Jude. 
It's, you're looking for somebody that does something different or does something really well that has what we would call an eye to their, to, to, to their game. And even from a very young age, compared to other boys of his age, Jude definitely had that, that eye, that kind of wow factor. Whenever we went out and played football, whenever he played football, for instance, he always shone and he was always really good. In fact, he helped us get to the national finals, which was really impressive because we ended up having to enter our school team into the district football and we got all the way through the national finals, even though it was just our school team rather than a collection from across the district. So that was good, yeah. It's a bit of a weird one, really. I remember there was, um, my dad always tells me a story about a scout coming to watch and he said that we should come down and maybe do a trial for the pre-academy at the Blues and it wasn't really something I wanted to take seriously, it was just something that I wanted to do for a laugh and my dad was like, all right, yeah, we'll, we'll have a look, we'll see. And we already knew Simon Jones from the pre-academy who worked there as the like, head of recruitment for that age group. The coach who had the biggest impact on my development was Mike Dodds. So I remember he did my first session in the pre-academy and then, and like I thought, this guy is so weird. He's like, he's, he's nuts. But then he started doing like the older age group. So we, I didn't have him again as my main coach for three or four more seasons, maybe to about under 12, 13. So then I had him again and he just like, coach me in so many ways, like made me a better person, tactically more aware, technically give me challenges and just always, I never never felt bored in his sessions in the games, he'd always give me something to do to develop, so that was perfect for me at the time. So yeah, I came into the pre-academy as an under seven, I think he was, um, with his kips the football boots on and his fake kits, I'll never forget his, his, his fake kits. Um, yeah, came in and was just like any of the real kind of seven, eight-year-olds. Um, I wouldn't say if you if you back me into a corner now and said would would he be where he is now? Could you predict that? No way. He was he was good, but he was no better than the rest of the boys. Um, so yes, he, I think he was probably about seven, if I remember rightly. Seems like an eternity ago, but when you actually look at it, it's like nine years ago. 10 years ago. I mean we have a really really active pre-academy programme and Jude was involved in that from quite a young age. Um, obviously my remit's across the whole programme so I spend a you know a proportion of my time in that in that element. Um, the guys were really excited by him when he came in, a very quick young little player um, and obviously as he goes through the age groups into the nines, tens, elevens obviously I saw more more of him because he'd be involved in our formal games programme. Under nines scored loads of goals, under 10 scored loads of goals in my own age group and that's when they started to say well you know we want him to enjoy it but we also want him to have some sort of challenge so that he is still developing and I remember getting told that I was going to play in an 11s game as an under 10 against Nottingham Forest and it was like I don't know any of these guys and I don't want to do it like dad please don't don't make me do it and then I remember doing the first half of the under 10s and they've said, and I've scored 15 because it was like the small sided games. And they said, all right, okay, you're going up with the 11s now. Like it's, you, you can't just do that. You're not going to get any better. And it was like, all right, fine. And then I went up and ended up scoring two in that game. And even then after that, it was like training was still not as enjoyable. But as time went on, it just, I just got used to the group of players and then just started enjoying it all over again, really. Thank you.
Birmingham were really good with my education. There was always linked in with my school, so I always found it easy to catch up. But then, as you get older, you know, you don't want to miss out on opportunities like games in the week or certain sessions with maybe if the 23s were joining in or something. You can get you can test yourself against those players, and so maybe I'd have to miss two days or maybe three days, two and a half days. So that got quite tough. But again. My school and um, Birmingham were great, just linking everything together, especially Mark Sinclair, just helping me get all, all my catch-up work and keeping up to date. To be fair, we've always said that. We've always said that we wouldn't allow the football to um, overshadow his education, and I think he was clear that education came first. Both myself and Mark always said if education started to suffer, then um, you know football would have to give. And Jude always understood that, and that's always been clear. And luckily, we've not had to go down that path, so that, that's been all right. I think because of their background, where they're so hard working and and that they put so much into everything they do, they they said, well, if you love football so much, we understand how important um, football is to you. But education is also just as important. So if you want to carry on doing the football, you're going to have to do the education to the best of your ability and, and that's not necessarily getting the best grades but that's doing all your homework, going to all the lessons, not being late, you know, they weren't asking me to be a perfect student, get the best grades possible but they were just asking me to give 100% all the time and I think that's something that that's crossed over into like my normal life and especially life as a footballer and like not giving up and always giving 100% in everything. It was, it was very easy to teach, it was a really, I'd say he was kind most of all, but like he, he was also a, a really diligent worker. But um, it was more, it was more than academics, it was the way he would look after some of the other children and uh, put himself forward for tasks. There was um, a girl in my class who was really struggling and we had to do something called a circle of friends for her. So we had to get a group together that wouldn't necessarily be her friends, but at, at, normally, but that if she was in trouble, she could go to them and he was the first one to put his hand up for that and say, oh, come to me, that's fine. And, and, and she, would, she would know that she could go to him and he was always, he was always there. And that, that's just one of the stories. He's, he very much looked after the people in, in his year group, in his class. It's really funny because the teacher would say to Jude, what do you think I'm going to say? And he'd say, yeah, talk a lot. So yeah, nothing's changed really. Probably a bit cheeky, but a nice kid, you know what I mean? Uh, looked after people if he could, but a bit cheeky, trying to be like a bit of a character in the classroom, so yeah, not much has changed. I think Jude can be whatever Jude sets his mind to be. I think even if he hadn't come into football, you know, some boys, they play a lot of football when they're in primary school and they go to secondary school, they get opportunities in different sports. I think whatever he'd chosen to do, he would have been very successful at it because he has that single-mindedness and that hunger and drive to be the best at what, whatever he does. In year five, he, he came to the cricket trials and he wanted to be part of the cricket team, a lot of his friends were. And uh, he, he put a lot of effort in, but he, he just didn't quite make it, he didn't quite have it. So the whole of that summer, he spent it practicing, working with his dad, and uh, came back the next year and was one of the best players that we had. And again, took us to the national final of the cricket. He's got such a great family uh, background, he's so stable in terms of, you look at all areas of his life, his schooling, his family, the, you know, his brother, you didn't have to treat him differently at all. I think we had to be quite unique in terms of the technical and tactical aspects of his programme, but in terms of him as a boy, um, I don't think we treated him any differently. For our programme we've always wanted to include parents and family members in the, in the process. I don't think you can get to, to the level the guys working within the senior team are without a really strong structure behind you. And that structure is often made up of different elements. For Jude he's got a really strong family connection. Um, they understand and they've taken the time as a family to understand the, our programme, understand the industry. Uh, understand the choices that exist in the industry um, and they've, they've been very supportive of the academy coaches and other disciplines to make sure that he does what he needs to do but again they've also been curious and inquisitive to say look if I'm gonna um, let my talented boys be at your, your institution and that, that would be the same in any walk of life you know if you had a top musician you want him to go to the best school and you want to know what he's getting um, so again, I think it's, it has to be a collaborative affair. Everyone has to know the rules of engagements and where the boundaries are. We don't get involved in some things at home. Um, you know, that's their parental decision. Obviously, we try to articulate what our plan is with him at the club. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree. 
Um, you know, but I think as long as there's you know, a trust built up there, then I think that's obviously as you go through the years and you've got a lot of time spent, um, you, know, you get a working pattern. And like I said, for us, it's been very successful across our programme, but obviously, especially with uh, you know, a young boy like Jude. I first got called up for England as an under 14 playing for the under 15 so I was I'm the 2003 age group and I got called up for the 2002 age group for a training camp so obviously nervous again thinking like I'm really good at Birmingham and I'm good against the teams we play against but how do I compare to the boys from City, Chelsea, Tottenham, Arsenal, United do you know what I mean so I go there do really well, find it comfortable and it's kind of, you kind of have that realisation that I'm, I'm not far off some of these and if not better and I go to the next camp at St George's Park so that's like getting more serious now, it's like you're closer to playing in a game and I remember doing really well in the sessions and kind of showing people that it doesn't matter what club you're from, it doesn't matter what category your club's in, you can go and make an impact impact and you can go and show that you're better than some of the boys at the, the higher academy. A lot of the time there was only me going to the England camps from from our team, you know, so I'm sure he he might be in the same boat. Maybe maybe he's got others that go with him, but a lot of the time it was I was the only one going from Birmingham. Um, you know, and yeah, you get there and there's twos, threes and fours from United, City, Chelsea, all that kind of thing. And yeah, initially it is quite you know, it's quite you know, daunting. You, you know, you've got to try and find your way in. You've got to try and um, fit in because these guys are spending so much time together themselves at their own club. And um, it was always something that, yeah, initially it, it was there. Um, and I'm sure Jude's dealing with this at the minute if he hasn't dealt with it already. Is that you, you let your football do the talking and you become integrated. They learn the respect for you as a player. Well, I remember coming back from those camps, and I think I went with Mitch Hancock, Josh Walker at the time as well. Um, Jack Butler was the year, year above me. Um, I just remember thinking, like, you know, not maybe not done enough to, 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 to be involved for the 60 Championship squad. I remember coming back and Terry Wesley and Steve Spooner talking to me and just saying, it doesn't matter what you do there, it matters what you do in the 16s. And by the time I played a couple of games for the 16s, I was already playing for the 18s or I was playing 45 minutes for the 16s and then 45 for the 18s or a full game for the 18s. So what I, I, I realised what I did at the club reflected on how I performed, how I was going to be selected for, for England. So, and I think that, that sort of trend continued. I did that, got called back for a game camp against Turkey. Didn't play as much as I would have liked to because I was a younger one and the squads got a bit stronger, still quite small for that age group, so that was fine. Took it as a learning um, point, C try, tried to use it as something where I could come back maybe in a couple months time or even a year's time and you know show, okay I was there for the experience the first time but now I'm here to be the main man, you know what I mean? So I, I got, got back two months later for a camp against Belgium, still for the 2002s, same thing same feelings after you know great experience but you know I want to be involved I want to I want to make impact in games and come back a year later and they kind of made it optional for me to do like a, the training camps and I thought well that, that's not happening I'm going and I'm showing from the, the first day why I deserve to be you know maybe captain of this group or an important player so found the training camps quite easy considering it was in my own age group and then got to the games and it's like they sit me down and tell me that they they see me as a great leader for this age group and from what I've showed in workshops and in training sessions so get given the armband for my first 2003's game against Holland um, make a couple of assists and played really well really enjoyed it and from then it was like this is like it's my group sort of thing this, this is the team that I want to try and like really improve and really help get better So at 18s I had Steve Spooner and obviously again really influential um, 
coach as part of my journey and helped me so much, especially with the transition to from 18s to 23s and 23s to the first team. He's always someone I could sit down with and he'd be so honest and let me know what he thinks. So. When, when you're on the pitch and he's coaching, it's strictly business really. And I think that's something that he kind of liked about me because although I was younger, I'd have a laugh, I'd be polite, I'd be kind off the pitch. But as soon as it got on, there's, like, there's no friends. You, you, you're there to compete with each other to show that you're better than them. And I think he kind of respected that and like it kind of showed to him what direction I want to go. The great thing about Judy is that probably up until the last 18 months, Judy's never been particularly big for his age. You know, sometimes players get played up because of their physicality. But then if they're, they're big and they've got talent, then it's something more. Um, but for Jude, it was just purely about talent. I think definitely that's what's made me like as rounded as I am, just having to battle for every ball and really throw myself around and go into tackles that maybe look like I'm going to come out hurt, but still just going in any way to try and win the ball. Just, just to try and show that like I'm fearless and I belong on any pitch with any players, yeah. There's always those sort of issues. Are you going to grow? Is he going to grow physically? How is he going to adapt? Um, and I think it got to like under 14s, I think I'd played 14, 15, I played for the reserves and at that point then I just, I, I hadn't really, that was, that was probably the first time where I thought, you know, like I'm starting to progress and a lot of people are starting to notice, but I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it too much. It was just more the excitability um, aspect of, of being given those opportunities. Today then, Blades Cup final yeah. against Liverpool to beat Manchester United in the semis. Are you looking forward to testing yourself against those bigger teams again? Yeah, obviously um, I'd like to be um, a good player, a great player when I'm older and to do so you have to be able to test you yourself against the, the best teams, the best players. I think I've done that in recent years against big teams, obviously Man U in the semi-final and I'll just have to try and prove again that I can do it. Did you get a stick from your mates at your own age group when you started to play up? Yeah, a little bit. It's it's not jealousy, it's always just banter really. Like uh, Everyone wants to try and play up age groups and so that's what, luckily I've been able to do that and then other people have followed recently and then, yeah, that's it. Finally from me, what's next? Where do you set yourself goals short, long term? Um, I think to establish myself in the 23s, try and get more appearances, uh, and prove that I can be trusted in games against players more physical than myself uh, and then hopefully one day, not too soon, in the first team. Thanks for talking to us, man. Good luck tomorrow. No problem. Thank you. Jude made quite the impression on his under-23s debut, scoring the winning goal at the city ground in a fixture with Nottingham Forest. A few more star-studded performances were to follow and a senior call-up was soon on the horizon. I was thinking, yeah, well, I'm playing with the first, uh, with the 23s now, quite regularly. I'm scoring, I'm playing well, I'm creating loads, and I've started training with the first team, and that's when I was thinking, you know, look, there's a record that I know about, and I'm, I'm not too far off breaking it. If, if like, I get the right opportunity, I get the right chance. So it was definitely in the back of my mind about how long I could be pushing for a first team spot, definitely. and blues in their chain strip, the charcoal grey shorts, shirts and socks. So we'll run through the blues team for you now. It's uh, quite a few changes, tend to be exact from Saturday. The only one keeping their place in the team is Steve Seddon. So it's the same shape from blues. We expect a 3-4-3 with David Stockdale in goal, a back three of Wes Harding, Geraldo Bajrami, one of four blues players making their debuts tonight. The other, of the four is Jake Clark Salter, who will also be in that back three. Josh Dakers Cogley on the right then, Steve Seddon on the left, Craig Gardner captains the side in midfield with Agus Medina also making his debut tonight, Charlie Lakey, Dan Crowley and Jude Bellingham who becomes Blue's youngest ever player at 16 years of age. <laughs>
I was always convinced that he would make it, you know. And maybe naive, you know, but I was, I had to, I had to make a decision. And, and I wanted to play him, and I wanted him to have a, a, a test before starting him or play him on the league game, you know. And I thought that was, that was a great opportunity in Portsmouth, you know. It doesn't matter, for me that day, it didn't matter the result, nothing was important that, that he played, it was important the others played, and it was important that, that the team carried through with the plan of focusing on the league, on the, on the FA Cup and understanding this cup as a, as a, as a support to, to the academy, you know, which is, which is very important because a squad's never been that big to tackle every competition. Yeah, so I, I remember playing in like 23s games because I was, still wasn't really involved in the games against Brentford and a couple of the other ones towards the start of the season and we were doing the, the game prep for the Portsmouth game and you know, you, you're kind of walking around expecting that you're going to be on the team that replicates Port, um, Portsmouth and all of a sudden it's like Bellingham, you're going to be in the number 10 and it's like, have I heard that right? Like, I'm playing and it was like surreal at the time. It felt like everything stopped and I couldn't really focus on training and I knew exactly what I had to do in the game but still it was like, all I could think about was the game and what I'm going to be like when I get into that. I didn't really think about it. Everyone else around me was, it, you know, you don't, I just think, oh, that's just regular. Yeah, it's okay, it's great. You know, I'm not a fan, so I didn't run around celebrating or anything, but for everyone else, it seemed like major, and, and then you kind of think, well, actually, maybe it's a, <laughs> it's a bit major. But yeah, um, yeah, it was amazing. I, mem I remember, like, trying to play it down a little bit, trying to, like, act cool about it and you know try and show to them that I wasn't nervous so they weren't worried but it was so hard because for me like I wanted to make sure I was doing everything properly the night before and I think they could see that as well how busy I was being with my preparation. I've actually got a photograph of uh, Jude Bellingham that um, he, he got uh, somebody to take some four or five years ago. He, he said he was 12 years of age. I remember someone saying to me like, um, that's Trevor Francis, like, and I was well aware of the record. So I was like, let me get a picture now with a couple of my mates and let me go right next to him so that in a couple of years time, maybe I can look back and be like, you know, um, I've done it. Of course, I wasn't uh, aware in those days, you know, how good a player he was, but I've watched Birmingham over the last, um, not as often as, um, I'd like to, but um, I've, I have watched them on numerous occasions. And I have to say I'm very, very attracted to what he's doing because he is a player of, um, you know, of, of a young age with great potential, with natural ability. Um, but I'm not just looking to see you know, how he performs on a Saturday or a, or a Wednesday evening. I'm looking at his personality and I'm trying to think you know, how he would cope you know, with some of the things that um, I had to cope with as a youngster. And it seems to me that, it, you know, you mentioned the, the, the words grounded just now. I think he seems very, very grounded. And it's like, wow, like, not only am I going to make my debut for the club that I've supported and been watching all my life, but then be the youngest ever player and like set a record, especially from Trevor Francis, who's gone on to be one of the greats of the game. You know, sadly, I have to say that uh, many of the, you know, young players today who are, you know, very, very talented, they don't have a lot of time for, uh, you know, players who have played the game. Um, they look upon you as has-beens and they're not particularly interested. So for him, you know, to show that kind of, um, you know, that interest, um, I respect him. And as I said to you, you know, I really want him to do well. Um, he's got a lot of things going for him. Got a good size, certainly taller than me, um, and uh, he's got natural ability. He's got an edge to his game. When I, what I mean by an edge, he can put his foot in. Very, very competitive. He looks to have good discipline. Um, he has, for one who's so young, uh, an understanding of the game. And now it's important that he continues to listen and to learn. And hopefully, he will go right to the very, very top. We've always, obviously we've always wanted to be a footballer since a young age, but since he's broke into the first team and being Blues fans, we've always, always wanted to play for Blues and, and that's increased this season. I think at the, at the time, at the time it was nice to have, um, but he, 
I, I look back and I think now, like I'm, I'm tremendously proud to have been like the second youngest at one point, um, behind obviously uh, Trevor Francis, and now Jude's obviously um, took that sort of number one spot, knocked me down to third. Um, now I look at it and I'm, 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 I'm proud because it's something that you know not sort of many players get to do and have that sort of accolade to be in any sort of conversations between a, a, a historical sort of accolade within a club. Um, but for me, it was more about once I'd sort of made my debut, it was about, okay, how can I stay here? How can I, how can I improve? What do I need to do to get to the, to the next level? Who do I need to stick around um, with the first team to, to, to do extras with and stuff like that? What do I need to do outside to, to, to keep myself occupied and keep myself, you know, focused on the, the sort of end goal? That was the, that was the thing. I didn't want to become another statistic of being yeah, he started at this age, but now, you know, he's in the conference and that's no disrespect to anybody who's in the in the conference or lower leagues, but with the ambition that I had, I didn't want to become anything less. And I think I think it was something that will sink in when I've like finished playing because right now it still doesn't feel real almost. Like I know I've done it, but it doesn't feel like that that big of a deal because I, Essentially, I've always got another game to prepare for and uh, I've got to show how good I am in the next game, so. I remember that day was literally like a film. I, I was trained the day before, not even thinking I'd be in the squad. Okay, I'm, I'm in the 20-man squad. Guarantee I'm not on the bench do the team meeting, I'm on the bench. 30 minutes in, someone gets injured, hour to play. I don't even go to warm up at the time. I think Dan Crowley and Kareem go, go to warm up. I'm thinking, you know, it, I'm, I'm not coming on here. Like, maybe they'll save me for five minutes. I'll come on, get a round of applause. And, and then it's like, dude, um, get warm. So I've kind of gone out and I can feel everyone kind of go silent. Think, oh my God, what's he doing going up, warming up? And then I'm getting warm, I'm stretching off, I've come back. They're saying, you're coming on, this is, the, this is set pieces, this is what you can do. And it's like, I didn't even have enough time to feel nervous because I, th I just thought, I'm going to be on in two minutes, so get ready. And I was on the pitch before I even knew it. No time for nerves at all. So it was, it was a change, but it was a nice change really to not have that, have that nervous thinking time. Yeah, so I, I think he's, he's, he's pulled his thigh or pulled his quad or his sort of hip flexor, that sort of muscle. It was quite high up on his on his quad. So, yeah, but the, the, the way he went down, you could tell that something had, had sort of happened. It wasn't, it was just a kick. You could, you could see that it sort of had pulled a muscle or something bad had happened. So just hopefully it's not too bad, too bad. An injury is not going to be out for too long. His home debut. And what a reception he gets as well. It looks like he's going to slot in on the right hand side then here alongside Davis. The ball landed to me and um, because I wasn't, I was probably close enough to shoot straight away but I think if you take the shot it's a bit greedy or it's the wrong decision and I carry it a little bit and I actually flinched the pass to Juki who I saw spinning off and I thought nah that's too tight and if I have a shot here, worst case scenario it's like we still won all with 12 minutes to play or whatever it was so I've hit it and not even caught it great like off the end of my toe sort of thing but it was like maybe with a fizz or a little skip off the ground it goes to the bottom corner forces save lands to someone else and then he gets his deflection and just like when I've gone to warm up everything just slowed down and that ball just trickled into the net and it was literally like although it wasn't a great goal it was like this is unreal like this can't be happening and Although everything, and you look at the celebration where like in two seconds I'm on my face, at the time that was to me like a slow-mo scene from a film. So yeah, unreal. Is Bellingham, is this his moment? He fights yeah! Oh, what a moment for Jude Bellingham! In front of the Tilton, 16 years of age, and turning the game on its head for Blues. Remember the moment. Jude Bellingham for Birmingham City. <laughs> it won't be one of the greatest goals you've ever seen in your life, but listen, he arrives in the 25 yards out from goal, has a touch out of his feet, hits a shot, takes a huge deflection, and ends up in the bottom corner of the net. 
Listen, but he deserves that, you know, he, especially from his first half performance when he was there. And listen, he, he must be the youngest ever goal scorer now for Blues. Obviously, the youngest player. And he, I watched him make his debut a few weeks back. And uh, what a moment for him, you know. Great, great moment for him. He's, he's going to be buzzing. It takes a huge, huge deflection, but that won't matter. He'll, he'll remember that for the rest of his life. The moment he came on against Stoke at home, because we had a lot of fans going to Portsmouth, but Sarandos is different, isn't it? Especially when you're from here, you're local, and you've been in the academy all, all your career, and maybe you've been on San Andreas for an under 18 game or something like that. But now you've got to play for, a, for your first team, the, the, the first team that you love. You've got to play for, for it at San Andreas at home against Stoke City. And, um, and we need to win the game, and, and the game is tough, and wow. And then he came on and, and he scored. It was not the best of goal, don't, don't get me wrong, but he did it. You know, he did it. So he came on for, for a good amount of minutes. He scored the winner, you know, established himself into playing in San Andreas. He loved it, he loved the crowd. It, that day I thought, well, you're right, you know, <laughs> so he can do it, <laughs> he can do it, yeah. It's like, I can do my best to put it into words, but I literally can't. It's like a happiness that I'll never probably feel again, like in life, you know, you got that much adrenaline and, you know, there's 20,000 people there and it's like they're celebrating this one moment and it's you and it's your moment. And that for me, it was just something that I've dreamed of for so long and it, it couldn't have happened in a better way, really, in a, in a better game when we were drawing 1-1. and So to kind of wheel away and celebrate with the fans and kind of start a little bit of a riot in that little corner, it was unreal. Your life changes very, very quickly um, and you do have to adapt. Um, but, you know, the, the feeling you get, especially when you're walking around the city then and you bump into people if you're out shopping or wherever you are, um, and then Blues fans coming up to you and, and, you know, basically one congratulating you and, and just giving you that, that love and support, um, it's, it's crazy. Um, and as I say, when you're from the, the city and you, you've supported the football club, it's, it's quite weird at first to, to make that distinction that actually I'm a, I'm a, I'm a player now, playing for my club um, and, you know, I can make a real impact and I'm impacting, impacting fans. And what next for yourself now? What are you, what are you looking to do? How do you hope to sort of build on this? Uh, I just try and keep my feet on the floor, which I've, I will do because I'm just so hungry for more. Uh, hopefully a start in the league and continue to um, do well in front of these great friends, fans and uh, for my uh, amazing teammates. Yeah. Jude had gone on to play 44 times in his first season as a professional. In what's considered one of the most competitive leagues in the world, a blue-nosed boy was taking the division by storm. Through three players, can he slip it down for Morante on the right side of the box? He can. Cut back for Jude Damn! Bellingham! Get in! Bellingham has done it yet again! Two weeks ago against Stoke, and this time here at the Valley, and in South London, in front of the jubilant Blues fans behind the goal. It is Blues that strike first, and once again, that man, 16-year-old Jude Bellingham. Job's in his Birmingham tracksuit, and I think, ah, it'll be fine. Like, as soon as we've walked into the away end, the poor lad has got absolutely mobbed. He has got absolutely mobbed. And I remember we had to find a little area in the away end where we had to try and protect him a little bit. Obviously, Jude's then gone and scored, and it was all carnage. Bless him. He was he was getting his air ruffled. He's getting dragged around everywhere. Um, but let's just say, um, I, I honestly didn't think the fans would recognise him. And we went and picked the tickets up. And I remember those three uh, three young lads. He's a Bellingham. He's a Bellingham. I was like, oh, this is going to be a long afternoon. We down the middle. Bellingham just got away with him. Otherwise, he would have shot first time. He went with the second bite of the cherry. Ended off for Bellingham. Just has to get his footing before standing up the loot defence. Great ball in! Oh, what a save by the keeper! And Ulf had to be strong there. And was a great tackle from Bellingham. He's got the Millwall defence on strings. Bellingham, great footwork. Bellingham! Ooh. What a goal that would have been. Bellingham battling well in the centre. Oh, he's got through an amazing three or four red shirts. A 
And now Collan can find Bellingham. Big chance, goal! Jude Bellingham's third of the season. And all of a sudden, Blues are right back in this game. It shows you how simple it could be, you know, four or five passes into midfield, out to Collan. Great little ball picks Bellingham. Third man run from Gardner, Bellingham doesn't need him. Great play from Bellingham. And they can come forward with pace as well. Good stretching tackle from Bellingham. Great energy from Bellingham. Great presence of mind. Go on, go and on, go on. And Yes! Come on. Three and a half gone. Crowley, low ball to the front. Bayer helps it on! And in, and it's Jude Bellingham who gets his fourth of the season. And it's a poacher's finish from him inside the six-yard box. And he is racking up on the goal tally this campaign. Final question for me, how far can Jude Bellingham go? Oh, he'll be one of the best players in the world. I know that about it. I've said that on record for a number of times. You don't want to put too much pressure on him because where he is. But he has all the... He has, he has all the components that you need to be successful and to be able to handle that level at the top. Um, you know, he, he, sometimes people will always say, you know, you know, what's he learnt off the academy? I think we've learnt more off him than, than he's learnt off us, if I'm honest. But that's a great thing for everyone involved in our programme to work and be tested by one of the, the up and coming best players in the world. You've got to appreciate I have a very biased lens on this because I've known him from the age of seven. Um, Every decision he's made up to this point has been, or say he's made, every decision he's made and his family have made has been very calculated. They could have left at any point and they haven't. To the present day, they've made the right decision because he probably now has the pick of most clubs around Europe. He's played 30 plus games in the championship, which I don't think as many 16 year olds across the world could say that. He's, he's talked about being one of the best young players in Europe for his age. So you, would, you could argue he's made the right decisions up to this point. So the point I would make is every decision that he will make, he, it will be very calculated. It won't be about money, it won't be about ego, it won't be about perception or image. It will be what is the next step in terms of his journey and what he wants to achieve. Because of that, I think he'll go to the very top. Um, is there factors in that will stop him doing that? Of course there will, injury and luck and all those types of things. But based on what I know, and I'm in a very privileged position because I've known him a very long time. There is no doubt in my mind that he's going to go right to the top. I think his biggest challenge is a shift. The, the most difficult thing for him is to do what he's done already. It's like play in Portsmouth, play against Stoke, establish his in the championship at your hometown. In your, in your own club. So that's the biggest challenge, challenge that, that he's done. So that, that should be his, his lighthouse for future. You know, yeah, I did it there. You know, I did something. I was, I was 16 and I did it. Of course, we, we, he had people that trusted him, you know, and, and, and we made sure that the tools were there to help him, you know, but he made it, you know. And so this challenge is um, possibly the biggest um, that he will have in his career. The rest, it will never be as difficult, in my opinion, and possibly his opinion in 20 years will be the same. Yeah. I think I just want them to be happy, be good men, um, achieve what all that they can and be the best that they can be. Um, and as long as they're happy at the end of it, um, I don't really think you can ask for more, to be quite honest with you. I want to win everything, you know what I mean? Um, club and country, I want, to, I want to do everything in the game. I want to be you know, a footballing icon, someone that's remembered and someone who kind of changed the game, maybe the way they've played it, but also someone that people love watching. We know obviously past is new now for yourself. What, what would your sort of parting words, message to those Birmingham City fans out there? I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for this season, for the way you've been with me, the way you've pushed me on and you know, the little bit extra that you've given me. And you know, whatever happens, I'm always a blue. As I said, this is my club. I love the club to bits and I'd, I'd die for this club. And, that, and I, I hope I showed that in the performances while I was here. I hope I, I was fun to watch, I was fun to, you know, interact with and stuff, because, you know, that's what I wanted to do. 
I wanted to, you know, bridge the gap between the players and the fans that maybe had been there for the last few years while they hadn't been an academy graduate and, you know, to do that and then, you know, take the opportunity like I've been given. I think it's something I had to do, but, you know, I'll only look back on Birmingham City with love and fond memories. Gee, thanks very much for your time and on behalf of all the fans, I'm sure, not, not um, out of place in saying thanks for what, what you've brought in just this, this season alone. Cheers, thank you. Cheers, mate.